here discussing retirement security. Our people are getting older and living longer. What does this mean to our retirement system, and what should we do about it? Let me start with some incredible facts. In 1951, when the old age security system was put in place, life ex expectancy was 69. And the age of eligibility was 70, meaning the average person would not live long enough to, to collect old age security at all. Today, the average life expectancy is 82, and eligibility starts at 65, meaning that people on average will collect OES for 17 years. Back in 1975, there were seven, seven taxpayers for every one senior. Right, on. right now, there are four taxpayers for every senior. And in two decades, there will only be two taxpayers for every senior. As we move forward, life expectancy is growing by 47 days per year. That means, in two decades, the average person will live till they turn 84. Which means under the existing rules of old age security, they will collect for almost two decades. Put together, these facts mean that in two decades, the number of people collecting OAS will double, the cost of the program will triple, and the number of taxpayers supporting each retiree will fall by half. By consequence, OAS will rise from 15 cents on every dollar the federal government spends to 25 cents of every dollar the federal government spends. According to the Macdonald Laurier Institute, on the current trajectory of demographics and program spending, the government will have a shortfall of $67 billion annually in today's dollars by the year 2040. Think of OAS as a glass of water. Retirees can only drink out of the glass in benefits what workers pay in in taxes. If retirees are drinking out faster than taxpayers are paying in, somebody goes thirsty. Mr. Speaker, we have seen the cost of drinking from the glass of profligacy in places like Greece and Portugal. And in order to avoid the, that kind of financial drought, we have put in a plan to make the system affordable and sustainable by gradually raising the age of eligibility from 65 to 67 starting in the year 2023. If you, are under, if you are over the age of 54, you will not be affected in any way, shape, or form by these changes. If you are under the age of 54, you have a lot of time to plan for these changes. Mr. Speaker, that addresses some of the cost problems with old age security, but there is another problem with our retirement system. 60% of Canadians do not have a workplace pension. That's because many of their employers are too small to afford the cost of assembling their own defined benefit or defined contribution system. That's right. If, let me give you an example. Let's say we're talking about a couple, Joe and Martha. One of them is a manager at a restaurant the other works at a corner store. Both of them would love to have the ability to save for the future in an employer-based pension plan, but both of their, neither of their employers are large enough to, to manage such a plan on their behalf. As a result, they only have RRSPs to supplement the government income programs that exist. 
but because they find investing on their own to be too intimidating and the market's too mercurial for their risk profile, they don't save for the future. But imagine if thousands of workers like Joe and Martha could pool their risks and share the management costs of an employer-based pension plan through a pooled system. That is exactly what we are proposing. The design of these plans would be straightforward with simple enrollment and management. A third-party administrator, normally a bank, an insurance company or pension plan would be responsible for the administrative and legal duties. What a relief for the small business owner. These plans would also be subject to the standard, standard pension rules that exist for plans across the sector right now, unlike RRSPs, which have no similar standard regulatory practice. Now, the opposition opposes giving small businesses the ability join together and pool their resources to provide their employees with a pension for their retirement. Instead, they propose massive new government entitlements. Not only do they fail to deal with the existing $67 billion shortfall that will result based on existing demographics and policies, they propose to, to stack billions of dollars in new promises. For example, the deputy leader of the NDP and the leader of the Liberal Party have both seconded and moved bills that would make people who live in this country, for, who've lived in this country for only three years, eligible for OAS, when the rest of Canada has to pay their whole lives in taxes in order to afford uh, that benefit. That would raise the cost of OAS and exacerbate the shortfall that exists in the current system. How would they pay for it all? Well, they say they will tax big business. What businesses are they referring to? Maybe they mean Canadian Natural Resources Limited. That's the country's largest independent oil and gas producer with, with over 100,000 barrels out of the oil sands each day. A perfect target for the NDP and Liberals. So the NDP proposes to raise taxes on that company's profits, but where do those profits go right now? Right now, they go to the shareholders of which one of the largest is the Quebec pension plan, Quebec's equivalent of the CPP. The dividends that Canadian Natural Resources pays to the Quebec pension plan today are enough to cover the full pension requirements of 1,100 Quebecers every single year. When you raise taxes on Canadian Natural Resources Limited, you reduce the dividends they pay out to their shareholders, of whom the largest group, one of the largest groups, are Quebec pensioners. So here we have the NDP proposing to raise taxes on a public pension plan. You wonder, Mr. Speaker, where their priorities lie. CPP is the same way. Over half of its assets are invested in companies like Canadian oil sands, Suncor Energy, Imperial Oil, Athabasca Oil Sands, or the Canada Post Pension Plan, its top five holdings, Toronto Dominion Bank, Royal Bank of Canada, Bank of Nova Scotia, Suncor, Canadian Natural Resources. Banks and oil companies, Mr. Speaker, the twin villains in every left-wing storyline are the ones who are paying the dividends into the Canada Post Pension Plan. You increase taxes on those companies, they reduce dividends to the Postal Workers' Pension Fund. What happened, Mr. Speaker, to solidarity forever? The truth is that there can be no solidarity when your entire narrative is based on dividing us and them. When you believe that the only way for one person to prosper is for another person to fail. When in this country, Mr. Speaker, the mailman relies on the profitability of the energy company in order to have his pension checked, we are all in this together. Right Through a symbiotic system of free market economics, the success of one is the success of all. We have a shared destiny, a common future, a united Canada. That is how we succeed, by sticking together and standing for what's right 
That is the formula for this government. Thank you. Questions and comments. Uh, the Honourable Member for Newton North Delta. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> it's hard to sit here sometimes and listen <coughs> to listen to some of the rhetoric. There is an implication in here, in my uh, honourable colleague's presentation, as if seniors in this country do not pay taxes. Well, I can tell you that seniors, many of them are my generation and others, are paying very high, their, their share of taxes are being paid by seniors. Just because you retire does not mean you stop paying pensions, so you stop paying taxes. And we have to remember that whenever we start expounding numbers. My question to my colleague is uh, very, very uh, straightforward. How does he think families who are struggling to make ends meet, families who, because of the policies of this government, are now working two or three jobs at 10 to 12 bucks an hour, and each month, their only intention is to get to the end of the month and put food at the table. How does he think this plan is going to put pension security on the table for them? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. She says seniors are paying too much tax, and she's right. Recent studies show that Canadians spend more on taxes than they do on food, clothing, and shelter combined. Let's look at the cup. The NDP wants to drink out of the cup of profligacy again and again. They want a government-run daycare program, $15 billion. They want to give OAS to people who have only lived in Canada for three years, $700 million. They want a 45-day work year, so somebody only has to go to work for 45 days and then collect, OAS for the rest, uh, collect EI for the rest of the year. There is another $6 billion. I could stand here all day and talk about the ways they would drink out of the cup of profligacy with the spending promises that they make, but what they forget is that somebody has to pour back into the cup in order for it to be replenished. And that somebody, inevitably, that somebody is seniors through higher taxes. She's the one who has to explain why she would raise taxes on seniors to pay for all of this irresponsible spending. Comments. Uh, the Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Uh, Madam Speaker, and I appreciate the, the comments. I always find it somewhat interesting when the member uh, provides uh, all these factual numbers. The qu question I have is one of credibility. On the one hand, the member says, the Parliamentary Secretary says, today we spend 15 cents on every Canadian tax dollar. And then he'll say, we're now going to, if we don't make these changes, we're going to be spending 25 cents on every, of every tax dollar on, on senior, on the OAS uh, program. Well, Madam Speaker, I don't buy it. I just don't believe the number that the member is trying to, to tell Canadians. In fact, I would suggest to you, Madam Speaker, that the government has created this crisis situation that we have heard from, the, uh, from professionals, statisticians, uh, actuaries that have made it very clear that Canada, as a government, can afford to keep seniors, providing seniors the option to retire at 65, that it doesn't have to go to 67. It's not going to be this huge burden. Why should Canadians believe, and I'll pick on one specific fact, why should Canadians believe that if it doesn't change, that it's going to be from 15 cents on every dollar to 25 cents on every dollar, when in fact the member himself likely knows that that. Order, please. Order, order. Uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, there's uh, one minute left. Why should they believe it? Because the number of retirees collecting OAS will double, the cost of the program will triple, and the number of taxpayers supporting each retiree will fall by half. These are unavoidable statistics that you can access by going to Stats Canada's website. Mr. Speaker, the average person, the average dead person today is 47 days older than the average dead person last year. That will continue into the future, meaning longer lifespans, meaning more collection of OAS. The reality is that we cannot have a situation where you have two people carrying one person on their shoulders in addition to all of the other social obligations that our, tax pay, that our tax dollars fund. These are inescapable mathematical realities 
We have seen the members' vision. I have seen it. It is called Greece. We choose here conservative economics, not liberal Greekonomics. <laughs>